And so uh, we have been in the book of Genesis now for many, many months. And as a reminder, the book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. So there is uh, the beginning of everything, which is the creation narrative. And then you've got the beginning of people. You got Adam and Eve. But then specifically, Jacob and this family that we've been looking at, they are the beginning of the nation of Israel. So if you're not 100% sure how the things fit together, Abraham was given a promise back in Genesis 12 and 15. And God said, look, I'm going to do this through you. I'm going to do a uh, blessing beyond anything you could understand. And it's going to include people, it's going to include kids, and it's going to include land, all this stuff. I'm going to do that for you. So that was promised to him all the way back then, and we're in Genesis 29 today. So in this family, which has been very messy, and I want to point that out in plenty of ways today, that this family is incredibly messy, incredibly sinful. They make a lot of mistakes. And so Abraham's given this promise. His son Isaac is the promised chosen child. It's repeated to him. And then Jacob, who we're looking at again today, is a guy that the promise is going to be fulfilled in. So for a long time, this family's been waiting for this to happen. Finally, in Jacob, it's going to a little bit after where we are today. But I just want you to understand the arc of what's been going on in Genesis as we look at this family. And I also want you to see, for those of you that feel like sometimes you get stuck in the mistakes that you've made, or maybe an identity that was given to you because of mistakes that you made, or decisions that you made, or whatever, the kid that you used to be, the young adult that you used to be, whatever. Like the cool thing about Jacob is he's known, when we met Jacob, he was known as a deceiver, right? That was his identity that was given to him, and yet Jacob doesn't end up that way. And today is part of that important journey. So if you're thinking like, man, like this, I'm stuck. This is just who I am. Like Jacob, that's the beautifully powerful thing about the redemptive God that we belong to. Because he's going to take this guy, this deceiver, and today is really formative. Last week where Pastor Tim was, he talked about Jacob meeting God out in a place called Bethel. So Bethel is an important place in the Bible, uh, not just because of the name, but because a lot of people have experiences with God there. In Bethel, in Hebrew, because the Old Testament written in Hebrew, is Bet El. Bet El means house of God. So Bet, house, El, God. Bethlehem, if you're aware of Bethlehem, that's Bet Lehem. So that is house of bread. So that's where Jesus is from, or where Jesus was born. And so this place, Bethel, ends up being biblically a, a very important place. Tim took us there last week. Uh, and Tim also showed us the importance of understanding uh, the principle of of loving God for who he is, not just because of what he can do for us. So that's also where we were last week. So Tim basically said last week, he showed us how Jacob was like, okay, I'll follow you on this next leg of the journey, but only if you bring snacks, right? That's basically what he said to God. Like, okay, God, that's cool. You're going to do these things for me, but I'll follow you, but you got to do X, Y, and Z. Now, why I think that was powerful, Tim basically said he was more concerned with his hands than he was with his face. What Tim meant by that is that he was more concerned with the provision than he was with God's presence. That's a super, super, super easy thing to do. It's a very human thing to do. I want to know that God has taken care of me and given me the things that I want and need, and if he's not, then maybe I'm going to doubt his existence. If he's not doing things, maybe I'm going to doubt, okay, maybe he's there, but maybe he's not good. Maybe he doesn't love me. Why does everybody else get this stuff and I don't, right? So we can easily get into that same thing that Jacob did. And that's where Tim was last week. That's kind of what he walked us through last week. And so this week, when we get back into this family and we pick up on Jacob's journey, we're going to be looking at consequences. And we're going to be looking at things coming back on Jacob that specifically mirror things that he did. And it's really painful and it's really awkward and you're going to see a guy in this part of his story today that's like, this could be like a movie. It's full of love and deceit and intrigue. It's like, there's like, there's so many interesting parts of, of this little section of his life. And so what you're also going to see is God's goodness in the midst of people doing stupid things and then having to pay stupid taxes because of that, right? I remember hearing that a long time ago. You, you know, you do stupid things, you're going to pay a stupid tax somehow, some way. Somebody came up to me right after service, and they said, you know, they were just listening to something this week, like a book they read or something like that. And the guy in the book was saying, making the point, you can choose your choices, but you can't choose your consequences. And uh, I was like, that's really good. He said, yeah. He said, that's the thing that was ringing in my head the whole time that you were talking about. It's like, I can choose my choices. I have some control over that. 
What I don't have control over oftentimes is the consequences that come as a result of those. And I remember a very old principle, so I'll just keep giving you little pithy statements this morning, is um, <laughs> it's like all of these things, right? They just, they, they, they're dredging all this stuff up from my memories. And so I remember a guy saying, you can either do hard now or you can do hard later. And you got to choose which hard you want to do. Like, you can do the hard things now, which are generally the right things. Like, you know, like, whether it's financial. Like, I'm going to do the hard thing. I'm going to say no to myself. Ugh, right? I'm not going to go out to eat. I'm not going to buy that thing on Amazon. Well, there's only two left. Who cares? It doesn't matter, right? Like, those things are hard in the moment. But I'm going to do that now. Or if I don't, I'm going to do the hard things later, like be in debt and be miserable and be full of anxiety because I can't pay the bills, right? So again, whatever it's going to be, I'm going to say no to food or later I'm going to say no to that pair of pants, right? And so it's like, which one do you want to choose? Which hard do you want? And so that's what today is, essentially. And the principle that you see out of Jacob's life, man, the bottom line from when I'm reading this passage today is that we need to be able to trust God with our messy consequences. This is a really hard one. Because the consequences that you might think about in your own life, some of them are going to be because of things that you did or said or thought or whatever. But some of them, unfortunately, are going to be because they were done to you. That's a hard one. That makes us wrestle with God's love. Like when somebody else does something and then we have to face the consequences because of that, that's really hard. So I want you to think, like, in your life right now, is there a messy consequence, consequence that one, you're responsible for or two, somebody else is? Like that's what I want us wrestling and think about this morning, like trusting God with that. Because when you have messy consequences, you can run, you can make excuses, you can blame. Like there's a lot of options. Or like Jacob, he's going to have that crossroads today and like he's going to have to decide, or do I settle into this and say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you with this. Because Jacob's feeling both. Consequences of things he did, consequences of things other people did. Like, that's hard to be stuck in that, you know? So I just want to, like, thinking about our consequences today and, and where we are. Jacob and his family are really messy, too. So let me set this up. So Jacob is a guy, another guy in Genesis that's going to have multiple wives. I just want to reiterate, every time we come up against this, this is not God's plan, right? God has already said in Genesis, early on in Genesis, when he put Adam and Eve together, this is my plan. God, you guy, you girl, very different. You're going to come together. You're going to be united in marriage. That sucks. And then you're going to have children. And then this is going to be a picture, the New Testament says later in the Bible, that's going to be a picture of Jesus and his church and how Jesus feels about Christians. Like it's a beautifully, deeply theological thing, marriage. But of course, we screw that all up, don't we? Like, we've got bad marriages, we've got toxic relationships, we've got fallout, we've got divorce, we've got all these things, abuse, marital rape, you've got, you got awful, awful, terrible things that we do to marriage. The Bible, the people in the Bible are no different. They're taking on extra wives. I'm like, no thanks, right? But they're doing it repeatedly. And God would say repeatedly in the Bible, this is not my plan for marriage. So just because it's in the Bible does not make it biblically acceptable, if that makes sense. There's a lot of things that happen in the Bible that you shouldn't do, but you should learn from. This is another one of those situations. And you're going to see how messy this gets with Rachel and Leah and Zilpah and Bilhah. Now, these names you don't hear very often, but it's like you're going to meet these four women today and, man, things get messy later in Genesis. So there's a lot of things that start this morning, all right? So let's jump in then. So uh, this morning, our message, good God, messy families, okay? So we're going to meet this family in transition in Genesis 29. So that's where I'm going to be. So if you have your own Bible, uh, I always want you to have that open, if it's, whether it's your phone or an actual like paper Bible. Uh, it doesn't really matter. That way, you, one, you can make sure I'm not lying, and two, you can follow along, make your own notes, and that kind of stuff, right? So let's jump in, Genesis 29, verse 1. So Jacob resumed his journey and went to the eastern country. So again, just to recap, Pastor Tim, last week, Jacob's in the desert. He meets God at Bethel, right, the house of God. He has this experience within there. So here's what happens to Jacob. He goes from, okay, I've just deceived, just in case you don't like, know all the details of the story. He went from, I just deceived my dad and my brother, and I cheated my brother out of something really that was already mine anyway, but I'm a deceiver, so I went in and I fooled my old blind dad, and I tricked him very intentionally, very methodically. I just did that. My brother, who is a very good hunter, by the way, now wants to kill me because of what I did to him. 
right? That causes some concern. So Jacob is told by his mom, who was a master crafter of the plan, the seat of her own husband and her own son, she says, you got to get out of here because you need to give your brother a few days to calm down from wanting to kill you, right? So what does she tell him to do? Go up to Haran, where our family is, and stay there with your uncle Laban. That's interesting, because if I told you to do that same journey, that would be like me today being like, all right, man, things are getting kind of hot around here. I need you to walk to Niagara Falls. That's what she's having him do, right? And so this is a very long journey. Partway there, Pastor Tim last week, that was what was at Bethel. So this week, he's, he's continuing on in that journey, but now he's a changed man, because now he's had this experience with God. Now he's been given a different focus in life. He's on a different road. Same road, I should say, but maybe like a a different look now. Now, instead of running for his life, now he's pursuing the mission that God's given him. And it's going to be all-consuming. Like, this is something, like, when God puts something in your heart, do you chase it with everything that you have? That, like, we're going to see him do that today. Jacob is going to chase this thing with everything that he has. So Jacob resumed his journey in light of what he did to his brother, in light of what he did to his dad, And this simple verse right here, so go to verse 1. So this verse starts a 20-year nightmare for Jacob. I just want to be really clear kind of what's happening, because it's easy. If if I just said read chapter 29 really quickly, you would just bounce through all the verses. And like, I know, a lot of them are easy to do that with. But if you don't know like where the story is going, and I want you to know this because I want you to feel the tension of what's about to happen to Jacob. So this little verse here, again, starts a 20-year nightmare for this guy Jacob, okay? So verse 2, he looked and saw a well in a field. So as he's going up to Haran, as he's going to where a family is, where he's supposed to find this wife that God promised, and he said, look, I'm going to take care of you. You're going to start the nation of Israel. Because if you don't know the story of Jacob, his name is changed to Israel, His grandfather Abraham is the very first Jew in all of history, right? And then the son, Isaac, his son Isaac is the son of the promise, but Jacob is going to have his name changed to Israel, and that's how the nation of Israel starts. So if you're like, where did Jews come from? Where did the nation of Israel come from? It's Abraham and Jacob. That's what's going on. That's, That's why they're so important. So as he's heading up there to fulfill this promise, he sees this well, and in the Old Testament, generally speaking, when you see well, and you're in a desert environment, that speaks to God's blessing. That speaks to God's care and looking out for you. So the fact that that's introduced is important. It's hard for us. Again, 21st century, it's like, oh, well, yeah, I've got one in my backyard. No big deal, right? But then it's like in that world, they would have understood that as like almost like an oasis, right? This is like a a place of God's presence. So that's verse 2. Now verse 3, verse 3, Jacob, so here's what happens. He rolls up on this scene. And I'm not going to read verse 3, I just want you to picture it with me. So verse 3, he comes up and he sees three flocks there, and the shepherds that go with him. So there's a bunch of sheep, there's these shepherds that go with him. Jacob doesn't know who they are, and he comes up and they're all around this well that's covered by this big heavy stone. The stone is probably there for protection of that well, right? Because the people that rely on that need that. And so he comes up, he sees this happening, and he's like, okay. And this is what he says in verse 4. Jacob asked the men at the well, my brothers, where are you from? Well, we're from Haran, they answered. So this is like number two. So there's the well, God's presence, God's blessing, kind of the the theme of the Old Testament. But then also these guys just happen to be from where he needs to go, where his family is from. So he's like, okay, cool. They're from Haran. Then he says, well, do you know Laban? And that's Jacob's uncle. Nahor's grandson, that's his great-great-grandfather. So he's making a connection to this family. And they answered, we know him. And he says, is he well? Jacob asked. So he's, again, making a connection, showing the concern for the family. And then they say, yes. And here is his daughter, Rachel, sign number three. Here is his daughter, Rachel, coming with Laban's sheep. So the timing of all this, the, you know, that there's this well, there's this kind of sign there, and then this rock that's on top of it, that'll be important in a minute. But then also the fact that the family's there, they know this guy, and then here comes Rachel. And Rachel is like his princess, right? This is the one God just promised him last week, I'm going to do this through you, and it's going to involve children and blessing, and like you're going to be the beginning of this nation, all this stuff. So he knows what he's looking for. And he's like, this is it. Like this woman here is it. So he's pretty excited about this. So all that happens. But then here's the kind of guy that Jacob is. So Jacob doesn't know these people at all. 
But here's what he says to them. He says, look, it's still broad daylight. It's not time for the animals to be gathered. Water the flock, then go out and let them graze. But they replied, we can't until all the flocks have been gathered and the stone is rolled away from the well's opening. Then we will be able to water the sheep. So again, Jacob, a very brazen, bold guy. Hey guys, I just met you, but you know what? You're doing all this wrong. (laughs) Right? Like, don't miss that. Like, that's the kind of guy Jacob is. Like, he just rolls up and he's just like, hmm, you bunch of slackers. Right? Because there's one or two possibilities here. One, one, they, for some reason, they can't move the stone unless everybody gets there, right? So Jacob's just like, why not? Like, right? So he's just like, where's your man card, right? It's like, there's that tension, or they're just too lazy, and Jacob knows it. They're out here doing nothing when they should be working, but they're just like, oh, we got to wait till everybody gets here. And so Jacob immediately is calling them out because he's just disgusted by what he sees. But again, that's the kind of guy Jacob is. We don't know it yet in this story, but Jacob's an incredibly hard worker. He's an incredibly smart and industrious guy. So for a guy like that, all we go, and again, arc of a person's story, all we know so far is that he's a deceiver and he's doing pretty bad stuff to his family, but he's got these really great qualities too that begin to come out, but they're kind of like marred. You know, like somebody, when I lived in the South, you'd be like, oh, bless his heart, <laughs> right? That's an insult, right? That's like a backhanded compliment you give somebody. It's like, oh man, you're poor creature, you know? And it's like, so here's Jacob, right? He's like, he's got all these good things, but they're kind of shining through some of the mud that's still kind of caked on him because he's in process. Again, Jacob is such an interesting character to me because he is in process. And so we see this kind of coming out of him. So he says this to these guys. And then in verse nine, while he was still speaking with them, right? As he's correcting them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess, which is not terribly unusual. As soon as Jacob saw his uncle Laban's daughter, Rachel, so just to clarify, this is his first cousin. This is who he sees. This is tight family. He sees her with Laban's sheep. He went up and rolled the stone from the opening and watered his uncle Laban's sheep. So here's the interesting thing, too. He was apparently a pretty strong guy, right? We always think, when you think, if you know the story of Jacob and Esau, it's like, oh yeah, man, like Esau is the big hunter guy, he's this big rugged guy, and then there's Jacob, and he's like this effeminate dude, like, and he's just at home, and he's like cooking food with mom, and he's just like a mommy's boy, and that's, and then that's kind of the image you can have of Jacob and Esau, if you, if you know the story, but here is Jacob grabbing this stone that this group of men cannot move, and he's just like, I pick things up and put them down, (laughs) right? So, Apparently, Jacob is actually a pretty strong dude. And you see from his work ethic that he's no wilting flower. So it's kind of like, that's, again, that's who Jacob is. And there's also part of this which is interesting because, again, if he thinks this is Rachel, the girl I want to marry, he's probably like, what's this, Rachel? <laughs> These other guys couldn't do it. Did you notice how I picked it up? Didn't even hurt my back. You know, and he's like... So there's a little bit of that, and then he's also immediate act of service for Rachel, because it's like, I want to be a part of this family. I want this woman to be my wife, so what can I do to serve her? What can I do to help? What can I do to make a good impression on her and her dad? Because we all know what I'm doing here, right? And so he's trying to make good impressions. So again, this is the guy, Jacob's thinking ahead. He's a smart guy, right? Unfortunately, we saw how he did that for a terrible purpose with his dad and his brother earlier in his story. But now he's like, all right, how can I do the right things? How can I, and again, you know, this good stuff is starting to shine out. Then the very next verse is super awkward. He starts to water her sheep for her. Then verse 11, then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept loudly. Now I read that and I was like, was Jacob socially awkward? (laughs) Like, did he not like know how to introduce himself to people? Because has Jacob introduced himself to Rachel yet? No. He sees her and he's like, yay. And then his next thought is, I should kiss her and then weep loudly. Like, that's awkward, right? It's like, did you see me just lift that stone up? I, I love you so much. I just like, I can't. I was like from like Niagara Falls all the way up here. And my feet are so. It's like, wow. Well what, what's going on with Jacob? <laughs> like, what's happening right now? with Jacob, right? And so this is just really weird. So culturally, not necessarily so weird, right? Kissing somebody and greeting, not weird. Men and women women definitely had different spheres, but he knows this is his cousin. She doesn't. Who's this dude smooching me, right? And then all this, why is he crying? But then verse 12, that's when he's like, oh, right. 
he told Rachel that he was her father's relative, Rebecca's son. So she's like, oh, you're my cousin. So she ran and told her father. So I want you to understand and feel the elation of Jacob in this moment. I want you to think about when things are going really well in your own life, and you're like on the top of the world, and then you get your guts ripped out, right? And everything comes crashing down when you're like, God, you're doing all this stuff. I know you promised me this. I know that I'm on the right path. I know blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden, you get wrecked. I want you to appreciate how excited Jacob is. Maybe even to the point he's not always thinking through maybe everything that he does, because maybe he's a little aggressive. Maybe he's like not thinking everything through because he's so excited about the mission that God has given him and he's seeing everything line up. Man, look at the well. Look at these people. They know who I'm talking about. Look, here is Rachel. I just rolled up here and God immediately is doing all this stuff. Because I want you to be able to feel how hard it is that he's going to fall when the deceit comes to visit him. When the very same thing that he did to his own family now is going to be visited on him. I want you to be able to get that because Pastor Tim said last week that when Jacob meets Laban, he's going to meet his equal. He's going to meet his match in deceit. What Laban, his very own uncle, is about to do to him is wretched. Wretched is what he's about to do to him. So he's so excited about getting married, but then the same thing that he did is going to happen to him. Now, I want to be really clear on this point, so please hear me out. What we're about to see happen to Jacob is not karma, and it is not the universe bringing this back on him. If you say, if you're here, you're watching or listening, if you say that you're a Christian, but you also say that karma is doing something or that the energy from the universe is doing something, that's sin. That's not, the universe doesn't care about you. Matter of fact, the universe could not care less about you because the universe doesn't have feelings, right? This pole isn't doing anything for you. This pole is not doing good or bad or whatever. It doesn't care. The universe doesn't either. And so for us, if you're a follower of Jesus, to attribute anything coming from the universe, really that, what the Bible will call that is witchcraft, right? And it's a pretty serious charge in the Bible. Or to say that it's karma, one is a total misunderstanding of what karma even is. In Western culture, we're just like, oh, you did bad? Then yeah, that's why you stubbed your toe. That's not in Eastern religion what karma is. Karma is about if you're a dummy in this life, you're going to get reincarnated as like a dung beetle in the next life. That's what karma is. It's about the next life, and it's about trying to get out of this life and escaping this life. That's all karma is. So as a, for a Christian to say, well, that's all, oh, man, that's karma, even to say it kind of like tongue in cheek, it's like that's, that's sin. That's sinful to do that. And, and it's just like, I know it's like, oh, wow, that's kind of heavy handed. But I just want you to understand what's happening today is a biblical principle from the very beginning that you will reap what you sow. That God is going to allow things, good and bad, yes, to come into your life because of the choices that you make. So, what's going to happen today by Jacob, about, uh, to Jacob, is a consequence of something that he's already done. And I believe, and here's the weird part about this I believe God is allowing the very same thing that Jacob did to be done to him so that Jacob will grow. So that Jacob will feel what he did to his brother, what he did to his own father. It's literally the exact same thing is about to be done to him by his uncle. And so I think this is part of Jacob's growth. I think it's just part of the empathy journey that, that he needs to go on and what God's going to do in him. But I just want to be clear, like, you know, Galatians 6, if you want to see that, you know, it says, don't be fooled, God will not be mocked you will reap what you sow. Like there's, that's a biblical principle that's been there for a long, long time. And so this, all this stuff now that's about to unfold, you kind of get that vibe. So in verse 13, when Laban heard the news about his sister's son, Jacob, he ran to meet him, he hugged him, and he kissed him. This is the second time that Laban's done this. When Abraham, Jacob's grandfather, sent his son, Isaac, out to Laban for another family relative. This has already happened, right? Because Laban now, he's already given his sister to this family. Now the same family's coming back looking for his daughter. So he's already been down this road with this family. So he runs out, greets him, and does something, again, we've already seen. He greets him with a kiss. Just like Jacob did to his dad, the deceit is going to quickly follow the kiss. Just like Judas did with Jesus, the deceit is going to quickly follow the kiss. So it's like a, it's, ah, man, so that's what he does. Laban, Uncle Laban runs out, kisses him. Then he took Jacob to his house 
And Jacob told him all that had happened, right? And he probably left out some of the other stuff, the bad stuff, like, oh, and by the way, I cheated my dad and my brother, and my dad, you know, my brother wants to kill me, and like, can I stay here for a while? Uh, you know, like, he probably skipped over all that stuff, but still, right, it's all happening. And he probably told him about what happened to him at Bethel, like, God told me all this cool stuff, and that's why I'm here, and all that. And Laban said to him, yes, you are my own flesh and blood. Now, sadly, what happens is he's brought back to the house. Jacob doesn't know it, but he's been invited back to the lion's den because Laban's going to wreck him for 20 years. I, don't, I just don't want us to forget that. Like, 20 years of Jacob's life is about to be given to this man Laban because of deceit. Like, he doesn't realize what he's walking into, right? He's so in love, right? So after Jacob had stayed with him a month, so a month he's been there, Laban finally says to him, just because you're my relative, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. So it's like, you waited a whole month, huh? So for a whole month, he's had to work for nothing, potentially. And now this little excursion that started off like God making this promise, I'm going to go find a wife, is going to lead into a living nightmare for Jacob. And this is like the opening salvo. Tell me what your wages should be. So now Laban, he has two daughters. The older was named Leah and the younger was named Rachel. So we have this dynamic of un- older and younger, and these two are incredibly po- important women. These are going to be foundational women to the story of what God does in the nation of Israel. So they're just being introduced here. And then it describes them. It says, and this is a very, very confusing phrase in Hebrew, and there's a lot, of, like I read a lot of commentaries this week and over the years, and it's like, what exactly is being said here when it says, Leah had tender eyes. But she's being juxtaposed against Rachel here in her looks. And it says, Rachel was shapely and beautiful. So what does tender eyes mean? Uh, you know, that means to like beat something or what? No, it's like tender eyes. That is, there's very, very important part of a woman's body back then and in that world. Because if you have everything covered up and that's all you see, that becomes a very, very, not only important part of you, but it's like an, it's an insight into who you are. So some people think that describing her eyes as tender was talking about who she was, not necessarily her beauty. But because of the way it's contrasted against the beauty of her sister, it seems it was negative. It seems there was something that was not, it it wasn't a good thing necessarily. But like what that was and what that exactly meant, was it something about her personality? Was it something that maybe she had like her eyes weren't right or something? It's like, there's a lot of speculation. But clearly like she's not the favored sister. Like that's the vibe that we're getting here specifically because Rachel is described as being so beautiful. So verse 18 then, how this plays out. Jacob loved Rachel, and he's very attracted to her. So he answers Laban, I'll work for you. And this this seems very brash. This seems like, did he think this all the way out? But he answers Laban, I'll work for you for seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. It's like, that's a high price. When I asked Brittany's dad if I could marry her, I was just like, I'll give her a ring. Like... (laughs) And I'll, like, take her away from Ohio forever, and she'll never be back. Like, and then I get to be her son-in-law. Like, ah! Right? I'm like, I didn't offer anything up. You know, but, like, back then, though, you did. Back then, you needed to offer. Like, that was standard. Like, if you wanted to marry somebody, it's like, okay, well, what are you going to give me? Jacob's flat broke. Jacob has nothing to offer. Like, he's got the clothes on his back because he's running from his brother, right? And so here he is. He shows up. He doesn't have much, but he's got a strong back. He's got good work ethic. So what can I give him? Well, seven is a complete number in the Old Testament, so I can give you a complete service. I can do that. I'll work hard for you. I'm industrious. I'm smart. What I do succeeds. Like, you know, he's like, I got that. So that's why he offers that. That's why he says that to him. So seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel, just to clarify, Laban. So Laban replies, well, better that I give you, give her to you than some other man. Like, I wouldn't be like, that wouldn't make me feel great. Like, I don't know, I guess there's nobody else around here, you know. So stay with me. So Laban is already scheming, because you're going to see, Laban knows what he's going to do to this young kid. He already understands, well, not young kid, but young man. So Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, right? So it's just like in one little half verse. It's like seven years just went by and they seem like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Again, feel the emotion. This guy loves this woman and he sees her as the woman of promise, right? It's not just like, oh, I love her. She's beautiful. No, I was just given seven years ago a promise from God and I believe this is the woman that's going to fulfill the promise. Like this is huge, right? This is huge. So 
he, gets, he works all these years, seemed like it's only a few days because of his love. And then verse 21 is kind of interesting. Jacob comes to Laban. He says, since my time is complete, give me my wife so I can sleep with her. It's like, whoa, easy, Jacob, right? <laughs> like, oh, they're a cowboy, right? And it's like, this guy's excited. And so when you read that, it's like, wow. But again, there's two parts of this. Yes, he's a red-blooded male that's excited about his wedding night. But also, again, Bethel changed him. He sees this woman as the woman of promise. God said, I'm going to give you children. And how's God's promise going to get fulfilled? Well, through this woman, Rachel. And so he is very excited about that. Yes, he's given up seven years of his life. So again, I want you to feel the excitement of the moment. I want you to feel he is absolutely finally at the mountaintop. This is going to happen. I've given seven years of hard labor to this. Like, what's that like when we're there and then tragedy visits us? Deceit visits us. So Laban invites all the men of the place and sponsored a feast. So this was like a week-long thing. And then the, sprung, the plan is sprung. So that evening, verse 23, Laban took his daughter Leah, not Rachel, he took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob, and Jacob slept with her. So after all of this time, he is in the very same way he deceived his own brother and his own father, he is deceived by his uncle with this woman Leah. Now I want you to think about the masterful deceit that's happening here because Laban always knew what was going to be the plan. Leah had to be a part of this, right? At the very least, when she walked into the tent or wherever he was, he would have been like, oh, hey, what's up, Rachel? And she would have had to respond to a name that was not hers. She knew what she was doing and she entered into that and these two, man, are totally running roughshod over him. And then the other part of this that people ask, and I've also wondered myself, is if he loved this woman, Rachel, so much, how did on his wedding night he sleep with her sister with her tender eyes? Well, if you're partying for a week and the vino is flowing pretty freely, then that may cloud your vision a little bit. That may, if, if you're drunk with wine, literally, and she comes in, culturally speaking, I didn't know this till this week, culturally speaking, there were pockets in the ancient Near East, and that's what this part of the world is called, the ancient Near East, that the wife would sometimes, not always, but sometimes, and there was a lot of ceremony and symbolism attached to this, she would wear the veil on their wedding night. So not every time her and her husband were intimate, but when that first night came, it was very symbolic and how the, it was like, you know, taken off afterward and all this kind of stuff, but it was like, so there is very real reasons while Jacob could have been fooled in the way that he was. Lots of wine and a veil, right? So it's like, it's conceivable that this could have happened actually very easily. But the point, though, is this masterful treachery on behalf of his own uncle and, again, his first cousin. So it's like kind of weird close relationships here, right? So in Laban, then, as a result of this marriage, he gives Zilpah to his daughter Leah as her slave. Again, cultural things, right? Cultural, just trading people, wedding presents, it's a, it's a common cultural practice to do this kind of stuff back then. And then you're going to see, next time we're in Genesis, you're going to see how this blows up, this little gift, because he does it twice, and it just it blows up and causes all kinds of problems. So then when morning came, I want you to picture this. When morning came, there was who? Rachel, no, Leah. You imagine that? You roll over, woman of your dreams, a little hungover maybe, and you're like, Rachel, I love, and then you see that Leah laying there, and she's like, what? Surprise. <laughs> like, you know, like, imagine that moment. You're like, finally, this has come true, and you look over, and you're like, this is a nightmare. Who am I next to right now? Right? Like, this is what's happened to Jacob. This is what's happened to Jacob, just like his own dad. Imagine when his dad realized what his son and his wife had done to him, right? So now the very same thing. Now he's feeling it and deeply feeling it. So he runs outside to Laban and he says, what have you done to me? Wasn't it for Rachel that I worked for you? Why have you deceived me? Like, let, let, just let that irony just kind of sink in, right? That he would act this way when he just got done doing this 450 miles ago right? Seven years ago. He just got done doing this, and yet this is how he reacts. And I think this is a, a pretty human thing to do. Have you ever looked at other people and been like, oh, they disgust me. I can't believe they do that while you're doing it, or knowing that you yourself do that, right? Like, we're really good at that 
at, at rationalizing and justify, justifying our own hypocrisy. So this is a pretty human thing to do, that he sees something as being horrible, and yet he does it himself. So again, the lessons that we can pull out of these people, because what he did to his father is just ridiculous. What he did to his brother, ridiculous. So Jacob now is being faced with our principle for this morning, our bottom line for the, this morning. Will you trust God with your messy consequences? What's Jacob going to do now that God has allowed the same thing to happen to him? Again, I think to form his character, because this is all part of the journey that he's got Jacob on. So Laban answers, It's not the custom in our country to give the younger daughter in marriage before the firstborn. And if I'm Jacob, I'm going to be like, that would have been a great detail to know ahead of time, Laban. Like, you couldn't tell me that ahead of time? So clearly Laban always had this plan. I'm not going to give you my youngest first? Are you kidding me? No, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to deceive you. And now I'm going to have both my daughters married off. And now I'm going to pull more labor out of you because I know that you're not just going to walk away from this. Like, he, man, this is the worst. Like, this guy is the worst, right? So this is what he knew he was going to do all along. And this, I just wonder, this younger, older technicality, again, was it the knife kind of twisting a little bit for Jacob? Like, God, I did that same thing. I just wonder, how long did it take him to actually realize, right? He's all, like, self-righteous here. But at what point was he like, oh, my gosh, that's right. That's exactly what I just did seven years earlier. So verse 27, Laban says, complete this week of wedding celebration. He's like, ah, come on, just relax, have a good time. And we will give you this younger one in return for working yet another seven years for me. And there's the plan. There's the deceitful plan finally revealed. And Jacob did just that. He finished the week of celebration, and Laban gave his daughter Rachel as his wife. That was a tough world back then, right? Uh, young women didn't have a lot of say uh, in anything. And so here's, again, a, more examples of people just being treated not the best. And here's an example of, though, Jacob, it's like, I feel like in this moment, Jacob's finally like, man, this is kind of a mess I've created. Like, I can't sit here and be all self-righteous about this. Like, I, okay, God, you made this promise to me in Bethel. And now I'm facing these same consequences, like the, thing, the same things I did. All right, Lord, you said you're going to do this to me, and now I've got to trust you. Like, I think it's in this moment when he just, like, he stops fighting. He stops making excuses. He stops pointing fingers. And he says, all right, Lord, I've got to settle into what's going on right now in reality. That's hard. When you face your own consequences, when you face God's discipline or wake-up calls, it's really hard to settle in and be like, okay, I'm not going to blame somebody. I'm not going to be a victim. I'm not going to make excuses. I'm just going to say, okay, God, what now? And I think this is Jacob's moment where he's finally doing it, and you're seeing like a really big change in him. He's just like, okay, and, of course, he does love Rachel. Obviously, he wants her. So that's the deal. You've got to work another seven years, and Jacob did just that. This is Jacob, I think, trusting God with his messy consequences. So verse 29, And Laban gave his slave Bilhah, so now this is the second time Laban's done this, his slave Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her slave. So these four women are incredibly important. Leah and her slave Zilpah, and Rachel and her slave Bilhah. So these four women are, in a, you're going to see next week especially, are going to be caught up in this awful race for Jacob's attention and love. They're going to be abused, like, just like, and almost because of their own doing. They're thinking like, if I just have, because in that world, if I just have more kids, he'll love me more. This is the rationale that's going on to try to earn his love, and it's just like creating more and more tension. But these four women become the beginning of the nation of Israel. So like I said, Jacob's name is changed to Israel. That's how Israel is a thing. And these four women are the mothers of the 12 tribes of Israel. So these four women are incredibly important. So I just wanted to like stop real quick and just say, these, this is who they are. This is how their story begins. Again, Genesis, it's beginnings. But also I want you to kind of see the, what the fallout we see later in Genesis. It's starting right now. It start like the seeds right now are all being planted for this stuff. And then verse 30, the story lands. So Jacob slept with Rachel also, and indeed, he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. So more favoritism, right? It's like it didn't work out for him and his brother when his parents did it to him and his brother. And now he's doing it. And now he's going to do it with his own sons. And his son 
is going to almost be killed by his other sons because of his favoritism for that son, Joseph. So Joseph is the favored son. Later in Genesis, we'll see that. So this is another sin. Just like deceit, favoritism is another generational sin that just gets passed down. So I want you to ask yourself, like, what generational sins are you going to put a stop to? If you've got kids, you've got grandkids, like, how are you working towards stopping these things? Or are you just going to be like, well, I'm just, this is how our family is, or this is how blah, 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 and like, just keep going down the same road that has always been trod by your family, right? Because we're seeing it happen here and the damage that it does. And, and so, like, I want you to walk away with this thing. I want you to try to think, like I said at the beginning, is there a consequence that's pretty messy in your life? Two, one of two things, potentially. Maybe that you've caused, and God is, like, waking you up, or maybe it was caused by somebody else. Like, how do you deal with those? Well, the first one, if you've caused it, and maybe now God is letting you feel the weight of that consequence, it might be like a smoke alarm. Now, smoke alarms are annoying, right? Especially when they're hardwired, because they go off through the whole house, don't they? And it could be over almost nothing. It could be over something small. It could be like, I kept the bacon in there a little bit too long, and now all my neighbors need to know about it, right? <laughs> it could be stuff like that. It could be like when we, one time at our house, so we've got like seven, I think, that are all connected. And one night, about 11 p.m., because this is when these things happen, right? All of a sudden, they all start going off. It's like blaring. I'm like, oh, there's a hidden fire. I'm running through every room in my house. I'm like trying to smell everything. I run outside. I'm like, is there fire coming out of the roof? I can't find anything, but I'm trying to stay calm, but I can't. I'm like, okay, I don't know where this is. There must be a fire in the wall. So, of course, what do I do? I call the fire, and I'm like, hey, I don't know what's going on, but I just need to make sure there's not something actually going on. Little did I know that the fire department that night in Warren was having a training night. So these guys are all hopped up and ready to go right? Like, like, let's go. And so I want to say at least 678 trucks pulled down <laughs> my road and we're a little dead end road. And they're like, there are so many trucks they pulled up to the driveway and then they disappeared down around the hill. But I can see all the lights, right? It's like everybody's getting woken up and I'm like, oh my gosh. And then like I see him and I'm like, all right, I better meet these guys at the door. And the first dude up, man, he's got an ax in his hand, ready, <laughs> ready to go. And I'm like, bro, like, you need to put that away, man. You're not chopping holes in my walls, man. Like, that's not going to happen tonight, you know? And he's like, whoa, we just got to be safe. And I'm like following him around the house. Like, no, dude, you don't need to be safe. Like, I'll let this thing burn before you chop it up, right? And so the chief comes in, and what was it? He knew right away. He's like, I bet I know what it is. He walks, and he starts looking at all the things, and he's like, yep. He pulls down the one out of our room, and he's like, there's a mosquito and some dust in here. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I was like, mosquito and dust? And he's like, yeah, it happens all the time. Don't worry about it. I'm like, oh, I'm worried about it. <laughs> my friend. I am worried about it. But as, as annoying as that was, I still wouldn't want to take them all in my house because what is the purpose of a smoke alarm? To let you know when something's going wrong, right? And so if we don't see consequences in our life as God may be saying, hey, there's something going wrong here. I need you to pay attention, right? Things could get worse. You could lose everything, right? That's how we should be seeing these things. So if you have messy consequences, you need to face them. You need to do something about it. Maybe you need to go apologize. Maybe you need to go make something right with somebody, right? And think about what you're doing. And then also, maybe it's because something somebody did to you. Here's what I see happen in relationships all the time, right? On, in, in church, a big part of my job is obviously relationships. And so something happens to one person, and they don't say anything to the other person. What happens? Bitterness. What happens in a church community? Bitterness, and then I'm leaving. Well, where did they go? What happened? I don't know. They, never, they didn't say anything. I'm like, oh, well, this happened, this happened, this happened. Oh, did you ever say anything? Well, no. You know, so again, if somebody's done something to you in a church, in a Christian community, you go and you tell them. You do it with love, right? And then if like, they won't listen, then you say, okay, we've got to get other people involved here because the relationship is that important. This community is that important. So you go and you do something about it. You handle it. You forgive that person, which does not mean forgetting it, which does not mean saying it's okay. It does not mean you can't have boundaries with that person, right? Like, that's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is releasing your right to punish them. That's hard to do. Because here's what unforgiveness is. Unforgiveness is drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. That's what unforgiveness is. You're killing yourself, and you think you're harming the other person. They might not even know. So in Christian community, again, something like whether it's our own self-caused messy consequences or somebody else's that spilled into my life, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with that? Are you going to run? 
make excuses, point fingers, or you can be like, all right, God, like, I got to deal with this. Like Jacob did. Jacob kind of settled into it. And he's like, all right, God, I just, I got to do this. This is the path that I'm on now. Let's go. Will you do that with God? And that's for you. I, I really want you to think, is there something in your life? And maybe there's not, but if there is, what are you going to do about it? So let me pray. Lord, I thank you for these, <laughs> each week for these stories, these people preserving this stuff for us, Lord. I thank you that they've walked this road so maybe we don't have to. I thank you that you love us enough to, um, to discipline us, to let us feel the weight of consequence, but walk through it with us as well. That you, uh, you promise us that, Lord, and you promise us that you love us, and so you discipline us, Lord. Help us. Help us, Jesus, when we're in those moments. We need you. We need you to do this right, Lord. So whatever that is right now, Holy Spirit, I just pray, whatever needs to bubble up, if there is something, Lord, would you do that work today? And I pray that in your name, Jesus Christ. And his church said, amen. I love you all. Have a great week.